Okay, so thanks uh, a lot for the opportunity to give this talk. So I will speak about the quantum spectral curve, which is an integrability based method to compute the exact spectrum of n equal four super young males. So it will be based mostly on my review and on the new works with these uh, people and uh, on other literature, of course, since this is a review. So this is a set of equations for the exact spectrum of n equal four super meals that captures the anomalous dimensions of all local single trace operators in the planar limit and is expected to be the ultimate solution for the spectral problem. And uh, so to highlight uh, some of the results, so the first major result was a high order recapping computations. So by now they have a package uh, in Mathematica which can reach uh, at least 10 loops or even more and uh, also, it works uh, more or less for all uh, operators in the theory, which is itself a rather non-trivial achievement. So then one can do numerics at finite capping with a huge precision of uh, 60 digits or more. Uh, and then analytically, one can study uh, various other limits, for example, the BFKL limit that has long been uh, very difficult to study and that gives a prediction for the most complicated part of some uh, PCD results. Uh, so then it can be extended to, to some other even non-local observables like quark anti-quark potential. So recently it has found, uh, the method has found powerful applications for fishnet theories, the simplified version of superior meals that reveals a lot of important structure. And the lastly, a direction which is rapidly developing is links with uh, not only the spectrum, but also the problem of computing correlators and the separation of variables. So these are just some of the results and uh, there are many more. Uh, so the subject has been reviewed in there. Are, by now, I think there are at least three reviews by Cole in 2017 and Valodia in 2018 and my review that uh, came out last year. So uh, just to briefly give the structure of the talk, first I will give some uh, motivations for the construction and then describe how it works for simple spin chains. And then I will describe how it actually is realized for super young meals. And then I will uh, give a pedagogical example to show how everything actually works. And I decided to discuss the numerical solution in detail, <coughs> since it's rather easy to explain. And uh, so after that, I will uh, discuss in more detail the uh, results that have been found in the extensions and what are the future directions. Uh, so, ah, so before I will go to the simple examples, let me give a brief historical overview of how the construction actually was developed. So first, integrability and uh, understanding of integrability in gauge theories more or less started with the study of radius scattering and BFKL limit uh, many years ago. Uh, so, and then in 2002, it was found that uh, in, in equal force premiers, there is also a uh, simpler uh, perturbative integrability for anomalous dimensions. And then it, it is complemented by classical integrability for the um, string theory, for the sigma model type. And uh, th this allowed to want to push the more or less standard program of uh, solving a two dimensional, uh, of solving the string world sheet model as a two dimensional integrable field theory. So starting with exact test metrics, which leads to asymptotic data and that's for spectrum in large volume or for long operators. <coughs> and uh, then the equations for exact spectrum were formulated in the form of thermodynamic beta and that's, uh, or alternatively Y system or Hirota equations. But this is still an infinite set of equations. And uh, the last step was to simplify them and uh, bring them to the form of quantum spectral curve, which is finally a finite system, which is also much more transparent and easier to work with. So that's how it was done historically, but rather than discuss all the details of, this, of all these steps, which uh, in any case uh, lead to only a conjecture, uh, I will present some motivation uh, for the algebraic structure behind this framework. Uh, which is already visible for spin chains. And uh, the first example for the simplest Heisenberg uh, GL2 XXX spin chain, which is just a chain of nearest neighbor interacting spins, so this uh, is standard Hamiltonian, the sum of permutations. And uh, it is solved by the beta and that. So we have a set of beta equations for these uj, which are the beta roots. 
and uh, they have some discrete set of solutions and then uh, the energy spectrum is found from them according to this formula but that's only one way to present the solution and in fact it's not the way which generalizes to super young meals so the way which does instead mm, is an alternative description in terms of q function so these are the polynomials that uh, contain we introduce one of them is q1 of u that's the polynomial whose roots are located at the beta root but then in a, we uh, let's uh, forget about the beta and that's at all and instead we use a different way to fix it so namely we uh, impose this relation it's a difference equation for two functions q1 and q2 on the right hand side we have a u to the l which determines for us the model under consideration in this case l which determines the you know, length of the spin chain and then uh, the idea is that if we impose that uh, these two functions are polynomials and this equation again has a discrete set of solutions which are equivalent to the beta answer so uh, more precisely what is the meaning of these two functions so the first one encodes the usual beta roots uh, but uh, the second solution it also has some roots and in fact its degree uh, is complementary to degree of the first polynomial so if this has the, the degree of that one is the number of excitations and then the, this one has l minus the number of excitations and the, in fact the meaning of these other roots is a particle hole kind of transformation so we can look at the same uh, uh, state of the spin chain in two ways so in the standard approach we start from a state uh, where all spins are pointing up this is the vacuum state and then the excitations are the spins flipped down which propagate along the spin chain with some momenta uh, that are parameterized by these beta roots but there is also a complementary picture uh, so for which is realized for this second function so where we start from the vacuum where all spins are pointing down and instead we treat spins up as the excitations which uh, mm -hmm. propagate with some different momenta that are precisely uh, the meaning of these uh, uh, roots vi which are also known as uh, u of beta roots <coughs> so uh, to summarize this uh, one of the polynomials encodes the particles momentum and the other one encodes the holes momentum one can say and they are linked by this beautiful bilinear equation once we impose that they are both polynomials uh, this uh, uh, gives the um, uh, discrete set of states and the solution of the model but it's u to the l minus one to be precise yes. yeah that's right so, yes so, so for this spin chain it, it, that's correct yeah. and for the minus one. Spin, why uh, u to the l minus m minus plus one i, think. I mean yeah no l it's plus m. one so uh, i think you should include twist otherwise it uh, yeah it's, it's uncurable <laughs> yeah that's right to be precise <laughs> yeah so, so this is a rough picture so it becomes very precise if we introduce twist in boundary conditions but uh, still qualitatively it's true even for untwisted spin chain. yeah any any questions maybe at some point at this point okay so that is the <clears throat> so these uh, q functions will are the main components of the quantum spectral curve for n equal four superior mills so that's why i uh, discuss them in such detail here in this uh, simple example and uh, to <clears throat> give some more details uh, what is actually the structure of uh, this uh, bilinear relation so first uh, the, another interpretation of these q functions is that of course they are solutions of the usual baxter equation which uh, to some people may be more familiar than uh, uh, this bilinear equation. So it's just a linear second order equation on one function Q. But since it is second order, it will have two solutions, which are precisely the two polynomials Q1, Q2. Uh, <coughs> for a given uh, polynomial T of U, which is the eigenstate of uh, eigenvalue of the transfer matrix. So again, once we impose that Q and T are polynomials, this uh, equation provides a discrete set of states. Oops. So, but uh, still the, the best way to describe the system is uh, using this bilinear relation between Q1 and Q2. And uh, to complete the algebraic uh, point of view, let me also separate this right-hand side into two pieces. So one of them is U to the L times one, 
and introduce two more Q functions. So this due to the L will be Q labeled by empty set. And this one is Q labeled by a set of two indices, one, two. So now we have uh, four functions, Q1, Q2, Q empty set and Q12, which can be organized in this nice diagram. And uh, <clears throat> the rules for such diagrams are that whenever you have a, a face with four vertices like here, then the uh, Q functions uh, at the vertices satisfy this bilinear equation. So in general, this is the its form, so, uh, where plus and minus just denote shifts by plus minus i over two. Uh, so uh, one may wonder why I decided to separate this, why I decided to introduce two more new functions. But the, the answer, of course, is that uh, this is the way to generalize construction to any uh, spin chain. So for example, for GLN, we again will have such relations where the indices run not just from one to two, but uh, from one to n. Um, sorry, is there is there uh, an expression for t in terms of the q's? Yeah, that, uh, of course there is. So t is just a two by two determinant. Like you can see here, the left hand side is a two by two determinant. In fact, for t it will be the same, but the shifts will be by i, not i over two. Thanks. Uh, and in fact, if you want to say transfer matrix is not in fundamental, but in higher rank representations, then uh, again, they are all expressed in the similar way with different shifts. So uh, this is quite universal formula, which is uh, also important. Uh, yes, and maybe, can I say, so in this, uh, in this equation with the Q's you have, there is QA plus and Q, QV minus. I think if you go to the higher rank case, you should have uh, more indices. So of course, of course, I, yeah, I will describe this just yeah. on the next slide. All right. So this is just the way, but the, in any case, one has these relations. So for uh, for any GLN, but there will be more. But there's no easy relation to the R matrix, for example. That's right. Uh, the one reason for that is that. Uh, uh, this Q or T, they are all uh, commuting operators, which are simultaneously diagonalized, and we just think here of their eigenvalues. But R matrix, uh, it's not that kind of an operator, it's not a conserved chart. I don't think there is any easy way to reconstruct R matrix from Q operators directly. Wow, well, it does yeah, not well, sometimes the right way do you need to reconstruct. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, because uh, this is what we know, right? Yeah. And this is uh, somehow, no, no, I mean, I don't know. I'm just trying to connect uh, right. uh, yeah, to so what, what we know. Yes. Well, we build the spin chain using the R matrix. Then we ask the question of uh, to, to diagonalize all integrals of motion. And then uh, these Qs in particular are integrals of motion. That's how to fix their eigenvalues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the connection to the R matrix is actually the most easily seen if you go in the other direction. If you just construct the transfer matrix eigenvalue yeah. from the R matrices, and then you see the Q functions right there. And then I think these other Qs with the higher order, uh, yeah, higher order polynomials, this is not so easily seen. And then you look at the, like these papers by Pronko and Stroganov, etc., where they have this. Q functions at the other side of the equator, if I'm uh, not mistaken. But suppose that I fixed my length L and I gave you all the solutions, let's fix L to be five or something, and I give mm. you all the Qs, can I reconstruct all the solutions of the Qs? Can I reconstruct the R matrix from that? It's gonna be very painful, right? Yeah, it's gonna be very painful. I think impossible would be a good way to describe, yeah. <laughs> well, for L equals two, I can probably do it. Yeah, 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 true, yeah. <laughs> well, especially if you know the answer, but if you yeah. did not know it, I'm not sure it would. Uh, but maybe just one comment. I mean, so if you start with all of these Qs and all of these Ts, and if you look at this as, so when you speak about a spin chain and the R matrix, the R matrix is going to give you the full set of operators which act on your Hilbert space. Whereas from Q and T, the most you can probably reconstruct is some commutative algebra of charges, right? You have much more uh, charges from the R matrix then will be then just the ones which commute with these operators. So you will only yeah. be able to reconstruct a part of the of the operators that you have from the queues. I see. That's very helpful. Thanks.
Uh, okay, so and then another comment this uh, kind of bilinear equations appeared in the mathematical literature, of course, before. So, they uh, some uh, version of them describes the defining relations for Grassmannian uh, manifolds, and uh, they are in this context known as Kluge relations. So, this uh, they have some uh, beautiful mathematical structure behind them. Uh, Sorry, so but those are those are just some geometrical things you're saying. Yeah, yeah, geometrical. Right, that's that's old 19th century stuff. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah, yeah so they're not. The first yeah. time I think in spin chains, at least the, the claim is it's Bajanov, Lukianov, the Malochik. Yes, probably that's right. Yes. For XXZ spin chain, and then I mean for XXX, it's a straightforward. It was generalized by someone else. Mm -hmm. Yes. So to is the on. connection to the Grassmannians meant to be no, uh, it's not uh, deep meant, or no, it's a, it is structural connection, but not more than that so far at least. <clears throat> so now, uh, so how to generalize this to GLN spin chains? So of course we know that beta ansatz generalizes and becomes a nested beta ansatz. But uh, you know, this uh, construction of QQ relations also has very nice generalization. So uh, for SU2, we had two, uh, four Q functions. For any uh, GLN, we would have two to the N. So for GL3, we have eight. And uh, they are organized in this hypercube diagram where we start from Q empty set. And then we uh, move in several directions. Each time we add uh, an index. So there will be three Q functions with one index then three Q functions with uh, two indices. And then lastly, there will be a Q function with uh, the full set of indices. And they are anti-symmetric in the indices. So I don't have separately Q2, 3 or Q3, 2. So the rules uh, are that uh, the vertices of this hypercube, they correspond to Q functions. And uh, more importantly, the four, each face with four vertices corresponds to the same UQ relation of the kind that I showed before. So this is the simplest one, and then on the other, on each face, we have a relation like this. So you keep writing GLN. Um, yeah. Well, is there a reality condition somewhere? No, no. So here I'm just speaking about uh, GLN and fundamental representation, which you, uh, typically is called the SUN in the literature. So that's uh, all I mean to say. Well, uh, this construction generalizes to any representation of GLN. And the, uh, more or less, it is exactly the same up to some boundary conditions. Like what is this? So, what's the reality on? condition in these? So, uh, is all the, the conditions that specify your model, uh, they come into the construction as uh, uh, mm, these boundary conditions on the uh, on some of the key functions. For instance, here we fix u to the l, and here we fix this to one. And this tells me that I'm actually in a spin chain in fundamental representation. As I understand, sorry, as I understand it, the, uh, you start speaking about GLN when you, uh, when you start constructing uh, transfer matrices out of these Q operators. On this stage, you don't have really the group structure. Uh, it's like trans, uh, transfer matrices are like characters. Yeah, it's a quantum. Yeah, yeah, but I also character. should say about but, in which uh, physical but Q structure. functions are like monomials out of which the characters are constructed. Yes, the characters are polynomials, uh, symmetric polynomials, and individual terms are like Q functions. But here it's a bit, uh, uh, that is right, uh, of course. But at the same time, it's a bit more tricky since uh, if I have fundamental representation, they are polynomials. If I have some infinite dimensional one, then the, some of them become non polynomials. So it actually fills the physical space of the spin chain. Also. Fundamental or symmetric or anti-symmetric, it will be, it's not yet here. You can just well, yeah, so the, these relations, certainly they are universal. Mm -hmm. And so you're saying if it's not a polynomial, if it's instead some Laurent expansion or something, then it could be an infinite dimensional representation. Yeah, then for, yeah, for, for example, for SL2, for SL2, only one Q is a polynomial and another is a has poles. Yeah, for example. Yes. I, I, I see. So really like, like Volodya is saying, like the characters, they would be different. No, the transfer matrices are characters and Qs are like uh, yes. individual terms in characters. Yes. Yes. Probably like eigen by this. Yes. Okay. You can say so. <clears throat> yeah, maybe you should go back to this TQ relation and it's clear there. So the whole 
the whole Hirota and uh, character story only applies, I, for as far as I understand, to the transformatrices and the transformatrix eigenvalues then. And these in taking spectral parameter to infinity in a proper normalization, you obtain back the characters of the algebra you're trying yes, to understand. Yes, of course. Yes. Exactly. If and you then, introduce twists. Huh? If you introduce twists, of course. Otherwise... No, no twist needed. Uh, if there is no twist, uh, you will reproduce the dimensions of representation. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, they are correct. Yeah, the dimensions, true. And then this u, uh, u to the power L, that really, de that really uh, defines what kind of representation you're choosing. Exactly. If it's rational, yes. if it is uh, hyperbolic or elliptic, whatever. Yes, yes, yes. So it's, we're already beyond that. Mm -hmm. basically. That's exactly. Yeah. All right, well, so here, just for the sake of presentation, I'm staying in fundamental representation, the simplest one. So that means I impose boundary conditions that uh, this Q function is U to the L, then this is e equal to one. So then the, the interpretation of other ones is Qs with one index, uh, they contain momentum carrying beta root. So now there are several, there are more choices of the initial reference state on which we build our states in beta and Z. So there are uh, several, duality frames one can say so uh, several uh, particle fold transformations that correspond to three choices of these functions and then the cues with two indices contain auxiliary roots of the beta and that's again there are multiple choices for them and, and so that's how the construction is linked to beta equations but uh, it is uh, in some ways nicer for instance it is much easier to understand which solutions are physical and which are not if we look at Q functions rather than individual beta roots. And this was recently uh, was explored in much detail in the paper of uh, Volin, uh, Cherniak and, uh, and Sebastian Bra, where they actually proved completeness of, uh, um, of this description for the beta states of the spin chain. Mm -hmm. so, right. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Just one, one small moment to, to, to precise. In principle, this Hussle construction is universal, right? Yes. Na na namely, whatever compact or non-compact Lie algebra I provide you, uh, in principle, Hussle construction could be built, and uh, for each phase, you will be always uh, able to, to, to have uh, bilinear or uh, analogous construction. Is this true, or are there any counterexamples? No, so as far as we are testing the AM series, so uh, SUM, type uh, groups, uh, this is certainly true. Uh, I'm not completely sure if it exists for other, the algebras like B, C, D, and so on. Uh, at least for some of them, certainly it exists. Because actually, that's, yeah, it does it's exist, but it's different than- it, it, Yeah, some, some yeah, it can be a bit different. Because I remember Vladimir Alexandrovich was mentioned that in principle, has a construction exists, but uh, if it is not, the, the QQ construction would be, uh, have any consistent meaning for integrable case, of course. So certainly for some of the models, it has been worked out in detail. Is it known in general for arbitrary group? This I don't know. Yeah, so of course, as far as I know, it's no, only known for AN. So the person who said something about the orderly algebras, where can you find this? Do you know? Well, we have an example in a BGM theory where it's a different uh, uh, symmetry. Yes. It's more but like- in general, that. it's under construction. <laughs> yeah, 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 okay, thank you. I think it emerged uh, in other contexts, like the ODE-IM correspondence, they have this type of relations for all the simple Lie algebra. That QQ kind of equation. Okay. Okay, so uh, now uh, the comment, which will be important later for ADS CFT, is that we have um, <coughs> a symmetry of these equations, if we forget about the boundary conditions, just look at these functional equations. So then uh, there is a symmetry where we replace Q functions by uh, what's known as Hodge duals of them. So this is uh, plus or minus the Q function with complementary set of indices. So this should be eight bar. So for example, instead of Q1, we introduce a new function Q23. So in this way, the uh, statement is that uh, Qs with upper indices will satisfy exactly the same QQ relations as Qs with lower indices. So the, this is kind of symmetry which flips the diagram along a horizontal line. Uh, 
<coughs> so again, it does not preserve these boundary conditions. So it's just a symmetry. Very further, not, not horizontal. Uh, your horizontal would be, uh, it's not horizontal, but this uh, uh, main diagonal. Well, it depends how you look, but uh, it exchanges Q full set with Q empty yeah, set. Yeah, this is on the main diagonal. This with that. But okay, it's well, not horizontal <laughs> in your well, he, Here on the picture. Oh, the well, right. up, up with down, whether it's a long horizontal line, this is probably something. <laughs> it's not. Okay, <laughs> right. So that that's one sitting straight. Around main diagonals, yes. It's reflection around. Uh, uh, yeah, that's correct. On the main yes, diagonals. Right. Okay, I agree. Yes, uh, that's correct. <clears throat> the reflection in the center of this hyperfield. So anyway, just replace the, the index by the complementary set of index. <clears throat> mm. All right. So uh, that's uh, how it generalizes to GLN. And then, uh, of course, it uh, generalizes also to super uh, spin chains so based on symmetry GLMN. So now the difference is that we have a Q functions labeled a bit differently. So we separate the bosonic and fermionic indices. So then we would have, for example, QA empty set, uh, where A goes from one to N, and Q empty set I, where I goes from one to N. And then, then we would, it's also allowed to have all possible combinations, like QAI, AB empty set, and so on. So these are the first set of indices run from one to M, the second from one to N. And the QQ relations are very similar to what was before, although they're written in a slightly different way, depending on the, which kind of indices we are looking at. But uh, again, they can be uh, written, um, summarized in, in terms of a Hasse diagram where four uh, uh, where faces with four vertices correspond to bilinear relations. And at the um, top and bottom of the diagram, we fix boundary conditions. And uh, <clears throat> so that's how the construction generalizes to any uh, supergroup. So a, a technical command is that in fact, this uh, set of relations, although they are written in a slightly different way, are actually the, exactly the same as for bosonic uh, case. Uh, up to, uh, we just need to relabel some of the Q functions and again flip some signs. Uh, this fact will not actually be used, just I wanted to say. Sorry again, it's not 90 deg degrees rotation for, it's only for M and equals to N, it's 90 degrees, otherwise. Yeah, well, this is very, uh, yeah. Just to be precise. This, this is a very vague statement. I never said what is rotation. You have to rotate uh, like n, n units. Yeah. Um, well, we are rotating a uh, hypercube, so it's quite. <laughs> yeah. Even, yeah, yeah, degrees. Degrees. Well, even <laughs> the notion of horizontal line is not very objective, like we discussed. So. Uh, but uh, what's important when you rotate the boundary condition will not be sitting down it will yes uh, yes 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 so that's if we if we map it to bosonic case then uh, the boundary conditions will be at some uh, uh, edge points not at the top and the bottom and the top and bottom will be some non-trivial function so that's uh, one reason why it's useful to label them in this way where we separate bosonic and fermionic part and then it's natural to fix which Q functions we fix, and also the uh, link with beta and that is natural again. This Q's with one index, uh, they are all directly associated uh, to the nodes of the thinking diagram in the beta and that. <coughs> okay, so this describes the structure. So then, uh, uh, another comment, ah, and uh, well, to uh, conclude this part, uh, the actual N44 Q system will correspond to GL4 slash 4. Okay? So the construction is directly relevant there. Uh, so a, a comment on the physical uh, meaning of this is, uh, so one uh, way to assign any physical meaning to Q functions is that uh, mm, if we go to appropriate variables, they actually define the wave functions of the model. So in integrable models, uh, like for instance, hydrogen atom, one can go to a basis where the wave function will factorize into a product of some building blocks. So in, for hydrogen atom, it's spherical coordinates. And uh, for in general integrable system, these uh, blocks will be precisely given by Q functions. It's, it's captured by those bilinear equations. So at least that's the expectation, which uh, has been made precise for various GL2, so SL2, SU2 models. And uh, for GLN, it uh, has been made uh, precise and put on firm ground only very recently. 
yeah, for, for more complicated models like super emails, of course, it's an open problem to make the statement precise. But uh, the expectation, again, is that Q functions define wave functions of the system. So does this scanning stuff predate uh, BLZ? Um, I think by a couple of years, possibly. But, uh, well, I'm not exactly sure about this. It looks like at least the dates are... Well, on the one hand, BLZ kind of proposed the idea of Q functions. On the other hand, well, they... Okay, I'm, I'm not prepared to make a precise statement on this. Of course, I think that Q functions were known uh, themselves even before, just as solutions of Baxter equation. Uh -huh. Then BLZ proposed maybe a more precise operator interpretation and, the, and field theory and realization of them. And that this QQ relation for them was made precise. But uh, this picture possibly was uh, around even before. I think there is also a paper of Klumper and Pierce even earlier than, uh, quite earlier than BLZ, which pretends on similar things. Just okay, perfect. Yeah, on. this is true. I, I'm a student of uh, Klumper, by the way. So. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, so I was thinking about what to write because uh, I think, uh, Professor Kasakov, in your papers, there's usually, and together with Sabrodim, you are talking about this. Uh, a BLZ uh, story, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't want to make anybody angry, you know. It's like, oh, I actually you know. cited a couple of times also. Yeah, yeah, no, this is true, but it finally it came down. But what is the thing with Alexandrov? I think so. There's this really old paper, right? Yeah, and so did he prove anything uh, in there about these bilinear relations as well, or is this because I don't really understand what's going on? I have to remember. I okay. Uh, I'll send you. I'll quite send an old story. Yeah, <laughs> I okay. reviewed it. Sorry for interrupting. Ready to answer. Okay. Yeah. But what is what is the claim? Uh, who who did what and when? Uh, roughly. I think it's about uh, say. Uh, I think it's about uh, uh, Ronskian representations of transfer matrices, something like this. Yeah. So it's not about SOV. The ah, to be, sorry, maybe also, but I'm not sure. No, no. no, no. Well, as far as I know, yeah. SOV really is different things. Yeah, it's something different. Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so that concludes the part about spin chains. So now let me describe how the construction actually is realized in the in equal for super angle. So without giving any derivation, again, I only give the final result. Uh, so, <clears throat> the starting point is that uh, here in uh, Supremius we have PSU 2, 2 slash 4 symmetry. So, that's a particular real form of uh, GL4 slash 4. So, the construction will uh, start from uh, the GL4 slash 4 Q system that I just described. So, uh, but then uh, one uh, first difference is that the boundary conditions are different now. So, Q empty set and Q full set of indices are equal to 1, both of them. So this, in some sense, reflects this uh, P. Uh, part of the PSU. So uh, <clears throat> it's not uh, actually a, um, a spin chain anymore, of course. And the second difference is that um, uh, for Q, for spin chains, it's enough to say that Qs are polynomials, then the functional equations fix them completely. But here in N equal 4 superend means they are not polynomials. And that's in fact the key part of the whole story. So for that reason, QQ relations are not enough, and we also need to impose some analyticity condition, uh, which uh, will uh, select the unique physical solution. And they are the most complicated part of the whole uh, program, which took so much effort to work out. So the answer uh, has the following form. So we start from a basis uh, of uh, four plus four functions, uh, known as PA and QA. So these are just the Q functions with one bosonic index and these are with one fermionic in the previous notation. So physically, roughly speaking, this P correspond to SU4R symmetry and describe dynamics in S5, rough, very roughly speaking. And the Qs correspond to dynamics in ADS. And so for them, we prescribe particular analytic properties. So namely, the P functions have a single uh, branch cut going uh, between minus 2g and plus 2g, where g is determined by cutting. And uh, the q functions, this qa, 
uh, they are more complicated. They have an infinite set of these cards, mm -hmm. uh, spaced by i and located in the lower half. So that's uh, the first statement. And then uh, you, uh, due to the QQ by linear equations, one can deduce the analytic structure of all other Q functions, which uh, mostly, again, will have an infinite set of cards spaced by i. Since, uh, the Q function, the Q, Q relations involve shifts of by I in the argument, and these cuts will propagate all over the place. <coughs> so then we also uh, uh, to actually select uh, the solution corresponding to a particular operator, we impose that uh, asymptotics at large U, that uh, these functions encode the R charges and the Q uh, encode the anomalous dimension and conformal charges at infinity. So the, this particular condition is the same as for spin chains, probably. Yes. Yeah, so, so like you remember, we had these powers uh, u to the m and u to l minus m. It's a direct analog. Where so for s u two, they encoded number of excitations, and which is the precisely the charge of the state here. So Feather, um, everything that you've written here on this transparency, the number four is special. Uh, but it doesn't seem to me that it would be special, right? You can do this for uh, in, everywhere you see a four, you make it 65. So that's, and, uh, uh, so some parts of uh, this are fine. So and uh, Of this transparency? I, I think here, everything yeah. is fine, right? Yes, I agree. That's, uh, that's can you tell us once you get to it, at which point it'll stop being fine? Yes. So that's uh, the next slide. Okay. <laughs> I don't think we have very scientific way to determine when it's fine, when it's not. We just know for four it works. Uh, that's basically. Right. Well, yeah. Well, if you just say that you want this analytic structure, I think you just impose it on these functions and those. Then the rest you reconstruct from them. And so probably it will be okay. It's, it may be not trivial to, to be able to satisfy this condition that the last Q is equal to one. So actually, I, I, I'm not convinced that it's fine for arbitrary numbers. Why? So you can read the statement is you can reconstruct all Q functions starting from these basic ones by some algebraic relations. And then in particular, you can reconstruct this Q full set from them. But you have to impose that it is equal to one. And it's not immediately obvious that it will be consistent with this uh, analytic structure for general size of the system. Well, that's, I disagree. These conditions you actually can easily satisfy. I think uh, there is one more condition which is on the next slide, which mm -hmm. will be harder. Well, okay, maybe. Because you can start from left right symmetric uh, configuration, all this, and then. Oh, ah, okay, right, yes. Okay, right. Uh, just, just a comment, a methodical comment. It's really a pity that you didn't start from long cuts for on, on the side of queues, because well, you, you didn't mention this beautiful symmetry between p's and q's because the same picture in the in terms of long cuts in q's on the one hand yes on the other hand i find it painful to think that functions in my equations have different analytic structure in left hand and yeah, right it's the detail the symmetry is more important <laughs> okay well, that's, maybe. that's of course well, the, but it's again it relates to probably the next slide what you said yes. because <laughs> uh, i think it's already too late <laughs> okay. yeah well Right, so okay, so what Valodia means is that if I instead I can consider this Q function on the sheet where I start the cut from this point to minus infinity and from this point to plus infinity, the statement is in this case all other cuts disappear. That's a powerful statement, of course, and which is more or less equivalent to what I will see in the next slide. Yes, sorry, could I ask a question about the previous slide? Yes. So why Qs are not polynomials or, or, or is it like polynomials of infinite degrees or? No, no, no. They are simply not polynomials. They are uh, meromorphic. They are uh, analytic functions which have no singularities uh, on the finite part of complex plane except for these prescribed branch cards. So why this is so? This is the result of a long and tedious way of deriving this uh, uh, construction from TBE, for example or from some uh, other way, and in the end, it's still a conjecture. Yes, but if, if you start with just like SL2 spin chain, and then you just, I mean, take the, the semi-classical limit, it also kind of, the, all the, I mean, roots of the polynomials condense, right? Yeah, but this is a different uh, uh, story. Yeah, yeah, so for SL2 case, actually, uh, you will have uh, four Q functions in this case, and only two of them will be polynomial. 
So already in SL2 case, you will see instead of this branch cuts, you will see poles, which you can think about as this uh, branch, uh, branch points uh, colliding to each other, forming poles. So in, that's the limit where you get SL2 thin chain. Ah, OK, I see. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, but, yeah, but these are only the, the Q functions that are not, so that are of this higher order, right? Or am I wrong if I say that? No, this is a very, very one index uh, Q function because uh, there is only one kind of momentum carrying, only one vacuum in SL2 chain, right? So another vacuum is like infinitely remote. And manifestation of that is that instead of polynomial for the dual Q function, you get infinitely many poles. Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, so that's a very good comment. Right, so this is the analytic structure of individual functions. So then to actually close the system, we uh, have to impose an extra constraint, which is known as gluing condition. So for that, we <clears throat> consider this Q function with one index, and then we look at its analytic continuation around the branch point. So this uh, procedure is very important, uh, denoted by tilde. So then we arrive to another sheet we, on which, in principle, we have some complicated uh, new function. And the statement is that this new function is simply different of the uh, uh, original functions with the flipped argument. So, up, <clears throat> so at least that's how it works for simple states in the SL2 sector. Mm, uh, and uh, so this condition is very non-trivial. So for example, it implies that this Q tilde will have uh, branch cuts only in the upper half plane. So remember, Q itself has cuts in the lower half plane. Once I flip the argument, it will be only in the upper. And uh, the fact that they are just equal will impose powerful constraints that, in fact, fix uniquely the solution of the whole system. So uh, <clears throat> that's how it works, at least for some simple states. So for more general states, uh, its analogy is also known. One could use, say, complex conjugation. Then uh, under this uh, analytic continuation tilde, so some Q functions map to complex conjugated other ones. Is this at all related to the Z2 or Z4 symmetry? Yeah, uh, so in the classical limit, uh, this uh, thing becomes uh, the um, sheet exchange symmetry of the uh, classical spectral curve, where you flip uh, x to 1 over x. So could I be of thinking x. of this as uh, um, some kind of Q system or so, so some, some kind of uh, statement in the, at the level of some quantum integrability that the Z4 symmetry is preserved? You, yes, I think that's valid uh, to think of it in this way. Uh, unfortunately, it's not the way to actually derive this condition, but uh, as a picture, it is true. Sorry, but why, why not derive it? But sorry, suppose you assume that you have this Z4 symmetry as, and, say, and say that uh, your Q system has got to preserve it. Yeah, then but you it's then... not uh, that clear. What does it mean for the Q system to preserve a particular symmetry? It's realized in, in the classical curve, it's a symmetry of exchange of some sheet. But here, it's kind of and quantized curves. It's not clear what it means to implement. Uh, but if you have a semi-classical limit, then you know, or not. I mean, you given the semi-classical limit, so, so let me ask it this way. Suppose I took the semi-classical limit of this, would I be then... Uh, yeah, are, there can... are there multiple ways of fixing the Z4 symmetry for the quantum spectral curve? Or is there a unique way? <clears throat> so from here, of course, you can derive the usual Z4 symmetry. But so, uh, semi-classically, all you actually semi-classical, all you know that when you go under the cut, the sheets exchange in some way, but uh, which sheet but is which way you don't which know. Which one is, depends on the solution in principle. Uh, normally, you find that experimental just take some simple solution and see, right? And then, for example, if you consider different boundary conditions like Wilson lines, then you'll see that sheets are connected differently, even though that... Yeah, yeah, okay, but let's just assume that you know the semi-classical limit that, that you can work out with some semi-classical calculation. Does that then uniquely fix it? So then okay. another subtlety which Andrea pointed out last time, that in ABGM uh, theory also a uh, similar green condition exists, but there, there are two terms on the right-hand side. And semi-classically, uh, this terms are exponentially large, so you don't see the second term. So it's not always possible. Yeah, that's a very good point. One more comment. Uh, I'm sorry, there are too many specialists <laughs> for you in the audience. <laughs> Dangerous guys. Uh, but uh, one comment about the long cut. If you keep 
the story with long cut as I would like to uh, for cues. Then the, uh, we recently discussed with Cole and he agreed that the, this condition where it's written more generally q tilde equals q bar, uh, it would just uh, be the complex conjugation condition. There will be no tilde because you don't go to, to mm -hmm. the next sheet, you just keep one sheet with long cut. Then this condition becomes simply the complex conjugation condition, the sort of reality condition, which is also nice. Right, okay, yeah, that's true. So it means that the razor looks as Z2 than Z4? Uh, Not really, because it also exchanges this index here. Uh, yeah, the real indexes I exchange, so it is Z4. It's like one with two, three with four. Oh, I mean, I don't know what you mean by Z4, but square of this uh, matrix is one, so. Yeah, that's, that's okay. You can say it is a representation of Z4, which is. Yeah, maybe it's split into two Z2. Maybe yeah. for, for very general solution, it will be the full Z4, I don't know. No, because you mm. deal with uh, eigenvalues. Eigenvalues of supermatrix are bosonic, so you, you can't realize uh, Z4 symmetry on eigenvalues. Um. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this tilde operation applied twice gives back the original function. So, <clears throat> yeah, it's not really Z4. Well, Z2 is Z4, so uh, don't be shy. <laughs> right, so that's uh, yeah, how it works. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe now, ah, okay, now I make a comment about the historical part again. So how it was actually derived? Uh, of course, uh, if we just write the Q system and then uh, we can spend an eternity of time trying to guess what kind of analytic structure we should prescribe and how to close equations. So the way it was actually found is deriving from a much more complicated from a dynamic beta and that. So in some simple SL2 sector, it is known. Then one can rewrite it in terms of Y system and then uh, in terms of T functions that satisfy Hirota equation. And then one can actually solve for the T functions. I mentioned that there are some Vronsky expressions in terms of Qs. So then one writes the solution. One has to impose very non-trivial analytic properties to make it actually equivalent to TBA. And then this fixes the analytic properties of Qs and the, everything that I discussed can be more or less derived in this way. So one subtlety is that in the process, uh, the system looks a bit different. It involves some uh, auxiliary functions known as mu or omega. So they, in fact, can be eliminated. Uh, this was realized a couple of years after the formulation. Uh, uh, leads uh, just to this simple analytic condition. So, but I uh, do not have time to discuss in detail this uh, derivation. And in any case, it works only in some special sector. Although it's uh, certainly a very important uh, step to derive in the equations. Right, so so maybe you, now, sorry, you said it yeah. only works in a certain sector? Yes, well, strictly speaking, the TBA is only precisely known for some state, right? Because the structure of driving terms could be very complicated. <clears throat> yeah, strictly speaking, TBA works for Kanisha and similar operators. On this. <laughs> right. But it's, it's not a fatality, probably it exists, the generalization. Nobody cared about yes. it after QSC was discovered. So can you maybe comment on, on what is the kind of TBA equations we are looking at now? Because you took a lot of uh, limits, right? Uh, colors to infinity. Ah, yeah. So this, uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so well, after all these limits are implemented, it just means on the, the string theory side, has a very clear interpretation that uh, we, after all gauge fixing and so on, we just have a two-dimensional field theory which is defined on the world sheet of a string. It's just some uh, explicit two-dimensional field theory with a very complicated Hamiltonian, but no. And then one applies the usual methods like S-matrix bootstrap, one can deduce the S-matrix of excitations, one can derive in this way the uh, asymptotic beta and that, and in the end derive the TBA, where the kernels in the TBA are, are, come from that S matrix. So so that's uh, how it works. And uh, that's, that's uh, the origin of all those cuts. They are also present in S matrix. Okay. So there is the story is pretty standard. But from the gauge theory side, there is no derivation. Well, it's the only correction that it's non Lorentz invariant theory. So. Right. Uh, that's uh, another complication, of course. 
All right, so now perhaps it's the time to make a break uh, before I, uh, then uh, after the break, I will discuss uh, how, so pedagogically, numerical solution and some other applications. So okay. let's have a coffee break or tea break for until five past. Okay. Yes, I 
So, uh, Fedor, uh, yeah. quick, quick question. Um, in spin chains, the length of the spin chain is a conserved quantity, but in uh, Young Mills, it's not. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. How do I see that? Uh, well, how do I, how no do I see? The, uh, the, the charges of the state are in asymptotics of these queues. Mm -hmm. uh, there is uh, no particular charge associated to length. But there is one in but, the spin chain. But Bogdan, you should be thinking about um, this asymptotic spin chain as a spin chain associated with quantum spectral curves, because that only appears as effective description in some limit. But this length, wait, did you say I should or shouldn't? You shouldn't. Shouldn't. Ah, okay. So there is, in a sense, underlying spin chain, which is exact spin chain, which has length zero. Right? So and then it is conserved as a, as a length. I think one of the great advantages of quantum spectral curve, for me at least, is that we can completely forget about beta roots. Uh, this uh, this notion doesn't appear anywhere. It's just asymptotics, cuts, and some uh, Riemann-Hilbert. Condition. Yeah, also number of beta roots is not conserved in a sense, uh, yes. because if you like, uh, you can do some uh, non-perturbative uh, analytic continuations uh, along which number of beta roots changes. Yeah. So you can start from asymptotic time. regime, arrive to asymptotic regime and find completely different set of beta roots. Yeah. Let's see. Let's see. So related fact is that uh, in quantum spectral curve, there is no separation into asymptotic part and the finite size part. Yes. So the same at once. So Fedia means like in principle by default you cannot run into this problem when your interaction range exceeds the, the length. So uh, this is why this is the only consistent description the asymptotic limit. This is big, since you mentioned especially from this uh, last slide for, uh, before the numerical solution. Whenever you start with TBA, you're already taking this thermodynamic asymptotic behavior, and this is no finiteness at all. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh -huh. Should we start again? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's start. So let's uh, continue. Uh, so one last comment is the relation to classical spectral curve. It uh, was already mentioned a bit. So in the classical limit, this P and Q, like I said, they are related uh, in principle to degrees of freedom in S5 and ADS5. And here it's visible explicitly. So they just become exponents of integrals of quasi moment of the classical curve in S5 and in ADS5 correspondingly. And uh, so well, what's nice is that uh, looking at this formula, it uh, immediately looks like a WKB representation of wave function, uh, which I can suggest that these P and Qs are some kind of wave function. Okay, so uh, let me describe how we actually solve this uh, quantum spectral curve equations. Uh, so there are ways to solve them, of course, perturbatively at weak coupling and in some other ways. Uh, so I will describe numerical solutions. It's probably the simplest to understand in a limited time. So first we start from uh, the functions P, which are the simplest ones. So they only have one cut from minus 2G to plus 2G. That's the usual Zhukovsky cut of the Zhukovsky variable, X plus 1 over X, resolved in this way. Mm, yeah, so in, the, in principle, one they should look separately at P with upper and lower index. So this is just uh, some other key functions. Well, I will focus on the case like in SL2 sector where they are simply related. So then what we have is that it's a function with one cut with the prescribed integer asymptotics at infinity controlled by uh, S5 uh, momenta. So that means that uh, after we resolve the cut, it becomes simply an uh, analytic function. And we can write its Laurent expansion uh, as an infinite series with some uh, in the Zhukovsky variable with uh, some unknown coefficients, C, which are the main parameters in the whole story. And they are the parameters we, we want to fix numerically, as in the end, they will determine the anomalous dimension through some uh, quite a direct formula involving the first few of them. Right, I think you said it's become analytic function. It's like a bit exaggeration because there are 
cards on the next sheet. Right, uh, right okay, that's uh, true. Yes. Uh, I just a Loran ex uh, expression. Yes. So Loran expansion with finite radius of convergence. So that uh, guarantees that I can write it in such a way. And uh, in, importantly, numerically, indeed, has a finite range, finite radius of convergence, so I can write it nice. So it has two radius of convergence. One is infinite, and another is smaller than one. So yes. it covers the branch cut. That's what. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So what we need to do now is uh, the C's are going to be fixed from the conditional Q's involving this tilde analytic continuation. So how do we impose it? So we need to reconstruct Q somehow. So the, the statement is all Q functions can be built in terms of this P. And uh, for Qs, what it means is we need to construct an intermediate set of functions that are QAI with two indices. So if we, uh, they are just in the usual notation of the Q system. So if we manage to do that, uh, the Qs are given by a trivial formula, just uh, sum of P times QAI. <clears throat> so the way to fix them uh, is to solve the following difference equation. So you can see it's a difference equation for the 16 functions QAI. Uh, so for it is of first order, so there are only two types of shifts. But uh, the index i is free in this equation. So for each uh, value of uh, i, it is a system of four equations that are intertwined with each other. And then uh, since there are four equations, they will have four solutions, which are precisely labeled by the second disk. Well, any case, in any case, so then we have to solve this system of a couple of different equations, so uh, which are linear, and the coefficients are built from p. Mm, yeah, so why these equations? Uh, uh, so where do they come from? This is just the QP relation of the original system. Uh, so here, uh, all QP relations are bilinear. Here, just one of the functions is Q empty set, which is equal to one. So and then one. Uh, <coughs> can see it's precisely one and the same thing. So we need to solve this uh, difference equation somehow then we reconstruct the Q function. So how uh, this actually uh, has been a stumbling point for quite some time, how to solve this equation effectively. So then uh, eventually we realized in 2015 that there is a very simple way to do it. So namely, <coughs> we start from a large U uh, high up in the um, complex plane. And there we can just plug in a large U expansion with some uh, unknown coefficients. So Q is just a power series. And once we plug it into here, we immediately fix these coefficients order by order in terms of the uh, P functions that we know. So this is a very simple linear problem that can be solved uh, numerically uh, with great efficiency. So given P functions, what is the large U expansion of uh, UAI? So this uh, gives us a good approximation to the true functions when the imaginary part of U is large. And then the next step is we just decrease imaginary part of U step by step by I each time using this equation, which relates Qs at the uh, points separated by I. So if we know them at uh, high up, uh, high enough uh, above, we just use the equation multiple times and arrive to any point we like. So what we need to do here is uh, to arrive to the cut where we are going to impose the gluing condition. So in practice, we take say 20 terms in this expansion, then 30 times we decrease the step and this already gives a good approximation of the cut. Uh, so now that we know the QAI, we <coughs> should impose the gluing condition. So we compute the Q function itself, like I said, just P times QAI. And uh, what we also need to know is Q tilde. And uh, here we use a nice trick that when we apply tilde, uh, QAI is not affected since it does not have a cut on the real axis. Only P is affected. And when we do, uh, when we apply tilde to P, it simply flips up X to one over X. So both Q and Q tilde are computed in an efficient way on the cut where we need them. And then we just impose this condition. So what happens in practice is that we set some initial values to C A N, then we go through the whole procedure, and then we see uh, how well this condition is satisfied on the cut. And our goal is to minimize uh, the difference between left and right hand side. 
So uh, this means we just have a minim minimization problem. And uh, this kind of thing is very efficiently solved by uh, methods like Newton's method, or in practice, we use uh, so-called levenberg markward algorithm, which is a combination of uh, Newton's method and the uh, gradient descent, which is more stable. And uh, well, I did not uh, show the uh, plot of uh, how well uh, the method converges. Converges very fast. Just I think that uh, people are a bit tired of looking at exponential plots these days, so I wanted to skip. But uh, the method converges with double exponential accuracy, or roughly speaking, at each iteration with double the number of uh, uh, known digits. So, any question about this implementation? Uh, now I will just discuss some results. I have maybe a comment and a question. So, I think this is the only case, uh, apart from the spin chains where the queues are polynomial, where you can directly solve the system without going through some integral equations and because yeah, right. uh, it yeah. seems to be because you have this uh, nice ansatz and uh, the one over x expansion i don't know like for for sine gordon and such models if there is any hope that you can directly solve the q system in a similar way yeah that's a very good comment i did i think people have trouble for most other models which in principle are simpler but still it's uh... I would think, uh, so in the uh, sine Gordon model, if I remember, Q function is also analytic in one uh, half of the plane, right? So maybe you can play the same trick. Expand it at large uh, parameter and then yeah, maybe we should use, uh, find a different equation to get to final point. Maybe, yeah. But I don't remember details. Okay. I think there is usually an answer uh, expanded over their zeros in the usual way, but then they have infinitely many zeros and they have some, they accumulate in some point. Like the, they seem to be complicated. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe one. Try. <laughs> yeah. Right, okay, so that's uh, the way it works. So this algorithm is very simple, can be implemented just on the usual laptop with one processor if, uh, if you don't want high precision it works efficiently on a simple computer but then uh, all the parts are very easy to parallelize and this way you can uh, reach very high precision so some uh, sample of results for instance here so this is the uh, anomalous dimension of uh, this operator of made of two scalars and the spin s uh, at finite coupling so we're here, what we looked at is the anomalous dimension as a function of the spin. So this shows the imaginary and real part of the dimension versus the real part of the spin. Now, the reason why it's important is that people have studied this, uh, this anomalous dimension a lot because it has uh, links to QCD. So in particular, some uh, of these, uh, of the points on this surface, uh, they correspond to uh, numbers that control uh, scattering uh, uh, amplitudes of uh, some high energy particles. And uh, here numerically, we can for the first time plot uh, the whole uh, analytic, the whole curve, the, and uh, re see that it has a complicated analytic structure that again was anticipated, but never really seen before. So this uh, first sheet is the kind of physical one, but then we can go through, we discover some cuts on it, we can go through the cuts numerically directly, then we arrive to some other sheet in principle corresponding to some, some more complicated operator. And then again, we discover yet more sheets and so on. So it's, uh, there is a beautiful structure which uh, we can explore in this way. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, and we, okay, we have generated a lot of empirical <laughs> plots of this kind. So this is a plot made from 2000 data points. And then, uh, so to highlight some other results, of course, numerics is not the only way that uh, we can solve the system. Also, there are many analytic results. So uh, for example, one particular point on this curve uh, near spin equal minus one that corresponds to the BFL regime where in fact uh, the uh, results in the N equal four and QCT become very similar. And then N equal four captures the most complicated or high transcendentality part of QCT result. So this uh, limit is when spin goes to minus one and coupling goes to zero at the same time. 
And because of some singularities, it requires a resummation of all orders of perturbation theory. But with quantum spectral curve, we developed some efficient analytic method that allows one to study, uh, in particular, this limit very efficiently, and we generated a new prediction uh, in 2015. Uh, so it's some next to next to leading order, which was not available for many years. And uh, well, in fact, this method can be pushed to even higher order, just technical difficulties. Mm, yeah, so then uh, a couple of years ago, this calculation was extended to more general BFL observables, which were also independently confirmed from uh, field theory. So another highlight is, of course, a weak coupling computation by Marble and Wolin in a series of papers. They developed a package and uh, a very efficient method to analytically solve the system with very, very high order in the weak coupling expansion. So at least 10 loops and probably more for some special operators like Kanisha. And uh, they can also prove some uh, general statements about the numbers that, that can appear in this expansion, like what kinds of uh, zeta values or multiple zeta values can appear. And these conjectures match uh, uh, at least, uh, <clears throat> uh, so, so they, they match some uh, theorems worked out by people working on rather esoteric subjects like motifs and so on, analyzing Feynman graphs and what kinds of numbers can appear from Feynman graphs. Mm. So that's just to remind that we are being recorded, right? So like, <laughs> yeah. right? Okay. So what did I say? Did I swear? I hope not. I don't know if esoteric. <laughs> well, esoteric is a compliment. So <clears throat> another, so I uh, decided I will not uh, do a list of all results obtained using the quantum spectral curves, and that would be uh, boring uh, probably for you and uh, certainly for me. So I will only highlight some of the achievements. Can you maybe shortly uh, remind us of what the connection to the solution of Q functions was? Because you, it's really kind of a hard cut for me because you explained all how to obtain these Q functions, but what is again the connection to this uh, anomalous dimension? Ah, right, so the, once you have the Q functions, then the one way uh, to extract the anomalous dimension is to look at asymptotics of these oh, yes. QI. Mm -hmm. It immediately contains the... So, but yeah. in practice, the way it's done is uh, slightly, uh, is even simpler. Once you have P functions, there is a simple formula in terms of the first Q C coefficients for the anomalous mm -hmm. dimension. And so, and so what is uh, the, uh, what is basically happening if you are calculating higher order of this Q function and what is, uh, are you increasing precision or? or yeah, what? so you start with, uh, you write, if you are at weak coupling, for example, you uh, uh, write these, all the functions in the quantum spectral curve as a series in the coupling. Sure. So all these roots, all these cuts, they collapse at weak coupling, they become just some poles. So they, they will be meromorphic functions at each order at weak coupling. And then you need to solve the whole system of different equations perturbatively order by order. Okay. And then impose this, uh, what, this gluing condition. So in practice, it's not uh, that simple to do, but uh, they worked out a method which does it to any order mm -hmm. very efficiently. Okay, can I also ask a question? Yeah. So it seems so that in weak coupling and in strong coupling, you have regular procedure to generate power correction. Yeah, that's not true. So at weak coupling, yes, at strong coupling, there is no systematic method so far. Ah, even, even so, okay. That's a, in fact an open problem. The reason is that all of these cuts, they kind of, if we zoom out, they kind of all uh, merge together and it's not clear precisely what happens. Something probably quite complicated. But observation is that the results are very simple at strong coupling and yes. we uh, always manage to guess the exact uh, results just looking at like 20 digits of numerics. Uh, it's normally some integer numbers and then, okay, some zeta three may appear. Yes, yes, so hopefully so there it, is a way. should be some systematic way, just no one uh, developed it yet. Okay, good. But but uh, I want to ask another thing. So um, my question is about exponential corrections. Probably uh, these dimensions can have exponential corrections. Yes, in weak coupling, it will be of the form e power minus something over lambda, and in strong coupling, uh, something like e power minus lambda something. Uh, 
Well, at weak coupling, so the, the perturbation is here is, is convergent. So there are no, no like... No, in, weak, in weak coupling, there is no such uh, exponential corrections. Because it's convergent series at large n, right? So it's convergent series. It's a finite radius of convergence. For the strong coupling, of course, there are exponents. For that, you can just expand Bessier, which uh -huh. is a result for like a built-in line, and you'll see exponential corrections. Yeah, yeah. So, and such type of exponential correction is strong coupling. So it's in principle. Um, yeah. So you can you can kind of deduce it quite easily at uh, uh, by, from the fact that what happens in strong coupling, the cut become very long which in another way means that all the, if you rescale your spectral parameters, then cuts merge together, right? So there will be like uh, Carmos, uh, accordion made of these cuts, right? And they become closer and closer. So there is some underlying periodic function with very small period, and uh, that's what produces exponential corrections for that. Okay, I see. Thanks. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, so another uh, so recent calculation that uh, I did with Michelangelo Pretty. So this is about a deformed model, gamma deformed super young mills. Uh, so that's uh, a deformation where we just insert some constant phases into the action, but it breaks uh, all supersymmetries, but uh, presumably it preserves integrability and produces three extra deformation parameters. A quantum spectral curve was proposed for this model uh, back in 2015, but uh, so there are some particular operators uh, which are made of just a few fields like this one so which uh, for which it was not uh, completely clear whether this uh, framework works because uh, uh, they interact also with uh, some double trace operators which have to be added to the action to preserve conformality and the story has been quite murky about them but uh, so we showed uh, that indeed uh, this quantum spectral curve is perfectly uh, fine and gives a finite answer despite all these subtle effects and which reproduces in particular uh, direct perturbative calculation involving these double traces. And of course we can uh, pull, uh, then go to very high order perturbatively, we can uh, plot it numerically and so on. Sorry, but this is uh, potentially quite surprising, right? Yeah, certainly it is surprising. Well, uh, this was anticipated a couple of years ago, uh, I think when the same problem was studied for fishnet model, which is a simplified version of that. And it was understood there that quantum spectral curve works and uh, everything seems to be fine. And but this is going beyond the planar limit. Uh, in some sense, yes. So we actually compute- Well, well it's, if it's mixing with Double trace right. operators. So well, it's, it's not really exactly mixing. It's rather that the, the correlate of two such operators receives contributions from double trace vertices in the edge. Right, right, right. Yes. yes. Yeah, but the double trace term that is entering the Lagrangian has a uh, uh, one over n uh, term in front of it. Yes. So it's uh, made exactly as uh, the only purpose of this double trace is to cancel the one over epsilon correction. The, sorry, the one over epsilon divergence. So you are putting the proper one on one over n terms in front of it to mix uh, together with the single traces. Oh, I see. So it just removes the divergence. Yes, exactly. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, how, how, do, how do you know that it doesn't give a finite contribution? He's giving a finite contribution. Contribution. Exactly. The, for example, the term that you are seeing, like uh, eight i sine uh, sine g square. This is a finite contribution that is coming only from the double traces. Well, it contributes to everything. Uh, yeah, this is only pre-wrapping, actually. It's coming only from uh, alpha square. Okay, then it isn't uh, a trivial result, meaning that uh, uh, what so you're trying to say is that uh, there are some contributions from non-planar diagrams, yeah, the which diagrams quantum are spectral actually, curve captures. Yes, yeah, diagrams it, actually yes. are not planar. Well, but that is surprising, right? Yes, but uh, the, uh, the one explanation is that uh, in order to have a real, con actually conformal theory, you have to include these double trace terms. So one could say that uh, if you in, uh, require your theory to be conformal, then it also at the same time becomes integral, which uh, on the one hand is surprising, on the other hand, on the hand come a bit natural. Mm -hmm. And then it turns out that to make it conformal, you have to include double traces, but then, well, nicely integrability captures them also. Yes. Yeah, but of course, this whole story indeed is uh, quite remarkable.
So uh, it works better than expected. <laughs> uh, right. Ah, so then uh, another important uh, case is that if you look at the same deformation, but take the deformation parameter to I infinity, which uh, is not completely legal, perhaps since it makes the action uh, non hermitian but uh, still it can be done uh, very easily, at least on the formal level. And one arrives at a very simple uh, action, which just involves two scalar fields and the quartic interaction. This is a remarkable model known as fishnet theory. So uh, with the diagrams that have, uh, so where one can see integrability more or less at the level of Feynman diagrams, was, uh, they were anticipated uh, much before by some logical, but the action was found only a few years ago. And uh, so, of course, uh, there is no supersymmetry, still it's a solvable model. And uh, the, uh, but, you know, the idea is that it uh, reveals a lot of uh, new structures, uh, a lot of structures that are very obscured in the equal cost of mills, but hopefully should be clear in this model. So it inherits a quantum spectral curve in a simplified way, but still, it, uh, so this limit can be implemented and uh, quantum spectral curve becomes uh, some uh, sim simpler set of different situations, which uh, very efficiently give the, the whole spectrum of this model. And what's also important is that uh, this may shed light on how to derive quantum spectral curve from gauge theory, with, with, because here what one can actually uh, derive at least a part of it from first principles, in particular using the dual string-like model that was uh, that is also known for this uh, theory from last year. <clears throat> so this, uh, there is much uh, to be done here and it's, uh, in my opinion, very important and uh, exciting uh, area of research. So another extension of quantum spectral curve is the ABJ theory that was already mentioned. So that's a three-dimensional John Simon's matter theory with n equals six supersymmetry which was known to be integrable and again so the, all the same steps were implemented and the quantum spectral curve was found. So one uh, difference is that uh, branch points are located not just at square root of lambda but at some uh, position which is a non-trivial function of the coupling and uh, using the quantum spectral curve there was formulated the conjecture for this function by comparing with some localization results uh, that so far reproduced all known data. And in fact, uh, the sim it was also extended to ABJ theory. So the case when uh, uh, the ranks of the two gauge groups here are not equal. So and the, lastly, I will uh, like to describe some uh, an extension of this uh, construction to non-local operators and in particular quark anti-quark potential, which actually corresponds to cast uh, in, in other in another picture, it's uh, the same as looking at the cusp to Wilson line. So where we if have an infinite equations before you continue. Yes. Okay, so this uh, non-local observable, the, Wilson, the cusp Wilson line, which was uh, studied a lot, of course, was uh, we are looking at the configuration of two lines that intersect at the point with a potentially a scalar insertion here. So there is a, they, these are the wilson Moldasen lines that also couple to the scalars. So we have uh, several parameters in the game here. We have a geometrical angle at which the lines intersect. And also to, on each of the lines, there is a coupling to scalars and parameterized by unit vector and the relative angle theta between these two couplings. And then, uh, so this, because of the, uh, the contour is not smooth, the configuration is divergent and the divergence is controlled by this uh, cusp anomalous dimension, which in many ways is analogous to local operator anomalous dimension. And uh, it is an integrable quantity. It can be described by TBA. And uh, then it was understood how to describe it by quantum spectral curve. So we can compute now this uh, cusp anomalous dimension in a wide variety of regimes. So some examples, if phi equal to zero, then we get a line with some insertion, which was discussed uh, uh, one or two journal clubs ago. Here, we get a one-dimensional defect CFT. Can now be studied very precisely. And then uh, another limit, when phi goes to pi, uh, the lines become uh, kind of coincident. And if we do conformal transformation, just anti-parallel, uh, uh, two anti-parallel lines, 
which correspond to a quark anti quark potential in flat space. You know, they actually, the anomalous dimension becomes singular. But nevertheless, the quantum spectral curve perfectly captures this divergence and uh, can be implemented very nicely. Uh, okay, maybe let me just very briefly say we have plotted. So this is a quantity that for which the strong coupling prediction existed from the early days of ADS CFT. But uh, now we can make a plot from all the way from weak to strong coupling and finally reproduce it. And of course, also reproduce analytically a weak coupling prediction for this quark anti quark potential. But uh, so recently, uh, there is, has been a renewed interest in this observable because of its, uh, since there are many parameters, we can play with them and uh, look at some simplifying limits. And uh, recently, we managed to link this. Uh, to use this example to establish some link between quantum spectral curve and a very different problem of computing correlation function. So that's in the remaining like five, 10 minutes, I would like to very briefly uh, say some words on this. So uh, I said that quantum spectral curve computes the spectrum, but uh, in order to solve the theory completely, we also need to know three point function. And uh, the problem of uh, computing these correlators is, uh, roughly speaking, the problem of uh, not the spectrum, but of wave functions of the states. And their rough expectation is the following, that since we know wave functions in separated variables, we expect them to be just product of Qs that we know very efficiently now. So the idea then is that to reconstruct the three-point correlator is some kind of overlap between the three wave functions. So, and they, this would map to a kind of a scalar product between Q functions corresponding to the three operators. <clears throat> so, since we know the Q functions very precisely, this potentially could give a very efficient way to compute you know, three point functions and circumventing some difficulties of other approaches. So, this feature has been around for some time, but uh, uh, in 2018, we finally managed to make it quantitative in a non trivial example. So where we look precisely at these Wilson lines, so we are, have a configuration of three Wilson lines in the shape uh, of, the, of a triangle. So which intersecting at three points, so in the divergences at each of these points play the role of local operators. So for example, this uh, whole observable has the conformal dependence uh, on the uh, positions of these three points, uh, uh, again controlled by the three cusp anomalous dimension. So we uh, went to some. Uh, hmm? Feder, just to try to get an idea of uh, how much more time you need. Ten, ten minutes. If that's okay. Five, ten minutes. Yeah, I, I was just a bit concerned because it says slide 35 of 70. No, no, no. It's actually 37 slides. The rest is garbage. <laughs> oh, okay. Don't worry. Oh, that's <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so just the three slides. That's it. Uh, right, so we are looking at this thing. It's analog of three-point correlator, and uh, we go to a limit where these couplings to scalars become uh, enhanced. So the computation boils down to resumption ladder diagrams, which connect uh, uh, these lines together. So I will not go into details, but in this uh, simplifying limit, initially we can find the result from diagrams, which is uh, completely horrible. But uh, once we map it to the QST language, it becomes extremely simple. And it has the kind of structure I uh, spoke about before. So it is a, a scalar product of uh, three Q functions responding to these three states, normalized by uh, the scalar products of individual functions, which is like a norm of operator, so, uh, corresponding to normalization of three point functions by usual two point function. And this bracket is simply an integral of the Q function along some vertical line. So this is a very simple answer, especially compared to the completely horrible result that uh, comes from diagram. So what's uh, uh, nice here also structurally is that we introduce this norm for the Q function, which is just integral for this simple case, just integral along a vertical line in the uh, argument. And uh, what we found is that the quantization condition, this gluing condition involving Q tilde, is simply equivalent to finiteness of this norm. So this is uh, conceptually a slightly different way to understand where this condition comes from. And the expectation is that the, uh, even for generic states of finite coupling, 
hopefully we can come up with a norm that would uh, replace the monotremy condition of the thermal structure. So we find uh, this uh, simple um, answer for the three-point function, which suggests that hopefully there exists some underlying framework which would generalize beyond this simple case. Oops, can you hear me? Some, okay. So then uh, in, a, in a very different regime, again, a similar structure was found by uh, Shota and Simone Giondi. And we have some uh, uh, results in progress for Fishnet theory. So uh, as another comment, there is much to be understood about separation of variables, even for simple models like spin chains. So uh, some concrete results beyond GL2 were found only recently in the various, uh, by various groups. And uh, motivated by this, we, uh, it's important to understand the scale of products and separated variables for spin chains also. And this worked, uh, was worked out beyond GL2 only last year. In the uh, first in two papers, uh, uh, so by me, Kole, and uh, Andrea, and Paul, and uh, Dima Volen. Then uh, uh, some time ago, a paper, another paper appeared on the same subject. Okay, so now I just come to the conclusions. Any questions on what I said? It was sketchy, I just wanted to, to show that uh, there are some strong indications of uh, more structures connecting quantum spectral turbulence really. So let me just uh, conclude with uh, some uh, open problems. It's not a complete list, but just a few highlights. So, uh, like was said uh, already, it's an open problem to uh, develop an analytic systematic solution in strong coupling, although we have some results for, uh, we can extrapolate from some results in one limit to strong coupling, get some analytic answers, and we can, of course, do it numerically. It would be nice to have it in a systematic way. So, uh, another question is generalizing this to other theories formulate quantum spectral curve, especially for ADS3, CFT2, and other lower dimensional examples. Then a, a conceptual question is how to derive it, uh, the quantum spectral curve from gauge theory. At first, it looked like a complete mystery. So now it is becoming more clear uh, due to, so that there are some hopes to actually do it, uh, due to the fishnet model where this can be done, uh, so more or less rigorously. And uh, the open question, which uh, perhaps is the most interesting, is to understand the link with correlators, with separation of variables, and other uh, off-shell observables like the G-function, which we are actively exploring at the moment. That's all. Thank you. OK, so let's uh, unmute uh, and thank uh, Peder for this very nice talk. And uh, please ask your questions. Uh, Fyodor? Yes. Uh, hi, is there, hi. Um, is, is it possible to find the large n limit of the Q system? Large n in the what sense? I, uh, uh, in the sense um, uh, that the the rank of the gauge group goes to infinity. Ah, uh, yeah, that would be. Uh, wow, 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 so, wow! Which gauge group? Sorry, <laughs> we are uh, no gauge. symmetry group with GLM, right? SUM. Yeah, so not for gauge theory, but say for spin chain. So it, it was never analyzed, I think. So recently in the paper of Valoja. Sorry, is the question about SUN as in the color of super young males, or is it about SUN the Okay. SUN spin chain. Like sigma model or spin chain. Yeah, SUN uh, uh, yeah. is a global symmetry. Right? Uh -huh. Okay. So we try. So they say a uh, seismic spin chain SUN and then goes to infinity. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. more, more relevant question is what Valodia is uh, exploring now, is, say, principal current field, where you also have some kind of Q system. Exactly. And, and that uh, we, we tried uh, with yes. Sebastian Laurent and uh, Stefano Negro. We tried hard. Okay, you write some equations which look uh, like continuous uh, 
say instead of discrete indices uh, on Hasse diagram, you have continuous indices, but then what? Then well, but then you understood it in a recently with Jenny and Sebastian. You understood at least a part of this. Uh, a part of the answer, right? Say so. It didn't, so in some sense, this n becomes like a new dimension. It didn't help for to solving, for example, the principal chiral field at large n uh, at finite temperature, which is an open problem. I was thinking about some kind of Hartree Fock approximation because you have you have Grassmannians, you have certainly fermions here, and uh, there is analogy with tau functions uh, in this limit. All right, yeah, that could be fun to explore. To some extent, should be sensitive to the type of boundary condition you impose, right? Even in the case which Valody explored, it was a very fine-tuned type of the configuration, as I understood, it's like very special state, which they consider with fine-tuned chemical potentials and so on. So I don't think there is a universal generic answer to this question. Oh, I sure, yes. Yeah. I wanted to ask, does somebody, does somebody take care of strong coupling solution of quantum spectral curve or it's completely stalled or there are answer, uh, unexpected difficulties which nobody knows how to I know, so how no one tried that. Uh, yeah. It's really hard. It's not that... I don't think it's really, really hard. Uh, yes, it's uh, other directions are kind of... It's assigned to Dima. There are many other directions. So. But yeah. Hege Dush also tried this a bit. Mm -hmm. No, but again, so observation is the numbers which uh, generates are very simple. So there should be a very simple way to, it's simpler in a sense than what you get at yeah. v-coupling. And v-coupling, you get multi-valid zeta function straight away, uh, like at four loops. Uh, five, mm -hmm. And they're only single valued. Well, so there far. A long time, it's just some, uh, rational numbers and very simple well this is a bit uh, yeah, who knows maybe they will also become multiple <laughs> Wait, no, at some uh, point but uh, it looks like complexity increases slow slower that's right yeah but in konishi you you do get uh, zetas etc yeah but, not yeah, but multiple. It, it's like for how many loops we can do like five loops it's still a single zeta and like zeta five only so it's quite pathetic mm -hmm. Yeah. Do we have more questions? Mm. All right, so let's thank Fyodor again. Yeah. And do we have next week's speaker? Yes. Yeah, Andrea. Yeah, next week you have uh, Lorenzo Bianchi, and he, he will talk about some exact results in theories with defects. And yeah, if you're here, uh, Lorenzo, do you want to say something? Maybe he will. Here, I don't know. I haven't seen him. Uh, he was okay. I think he left. Mm -hmm. Right, so and also we, 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 we think so we also, if you want to propose yourself uh, for the seminars, please uh, feel free. Thank you, Andrea. And on, uh, from my side, I would like to thank again the organizers of this uh, journal club, which I think uh, is a really great idea. Yeah, it helps us all to stay in tune and also preserve our mental health. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure about that, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, to, to the extent that it exists. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you are giving yourself a too big compliment. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to the extent that we had any of it in the first place. All right, let me got some love. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so if, if you have ideas, proposal for next speakers, even though we like booked until the middle of May already, I think, please <laughs> feel free. <laughs> okay, and hopefully see you next week. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye. 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 Thanks for the